Okay, so today is October 1st, 2013. Just wanted to say that for the beginning of the recording. And we don't have a particular topic, so if there's anything that people want to discuss, we can go into that area depending where the spirit leads. Um, Roland mentioned a couple of things already, so we're going to start with that. And if anyone else has things. So first, Roland, before we go into Psalm 23 in connection with Ezekiel 37, uh, did you want to kind of go through a few of the reasons why uh, Ezekiel 37 is a symbolic resurrection? And then we could go into that. Well, I just thought it was uh, symbolic because the first 11 verses did not mention opening graves, but verses 12 through 14 talks about what God will do when he opens the graves. Right. Now, the context of it, right? So, uh, and I'll just mention this, even uh, Victor Hodafi talked about this in terms of the seven trumpets and the seven seals. He says it must be either holy figurative or holy literal language. Because if it goes back and forth between figurative and literal all the time, what criteria do we have to determine what is supposed to be figurative and what is supposed to be literal? So I think it'd be good before we go into Psalm 23 at all to kind of review that as far as the resurrection in Ezekiel 37 and see if it's symbolic or literal. Um, go ahead, Leroy. Yes, does that rule apply all the time? I've got my friend Roger, he's got this idea about the popes being the kings in Revelation there, but he, he, he uses the seven hills of Rome and then he uses something else that, you know, it's using both literal and symbolic language there. I told him he can't do that. I wonder if that rule applied, would apply to that. Well, as far as that goes with the kings, that, the kings, that was not part of, if I remember correctly, that wasn't part of the symbolic prophecy. That was part of the explanation. So we have it in Revelation and Daniel and a number of these prophecies where we have the vision itself and then the angel explains at least some of what is in the vision. And so in that, you know, the explanation isn't going to be symbolic. It's just the vision itself. Right. Yeah. I might be wrong so, about that. He's calling the kings, the pope, the last seven popes or something. I, yeah. I could be and wrong about what, what he's saying they are, but anyway. If you look at what Victor Hoddick says about that, in Shepherd's Rod Volume 2 is where he primarily deals with that, if I remember correctly. And in there, you can see why that doesn't quite work. Another reason, I'll just mention quickly why that doesn't really work. Lots of people look at it and they say that in Revelation 17, okay, it says, uh, yeah, verses 9 and 10 of Revelation 17, it says, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So lots of times what people miss, lots of times people will say that it says, and they are seven kings. So they say that those seven mountains the seven heads are seven kings, and they kind of bundle all those together. But really, it tells you that the seven heads are seven mountains, and there are seven kings. So the seven kings are distinct from the seven mountains. But that's, to go more into detail on that, would be maybe even later in this WebEx meeting, but not. Well, yet, just because we're going to go into Ezekiel 37 first. But. So, going now to Ezekiel 37, we want to examine this first to see whether or not this prophecy is symbolic or literal, 
and in particular whether or not the resurrection there is symbolic or literal. And there's a number of things in connection with this, but first off, I'm wondering, would somebody be willing to read uh, verses 1 all the way up till the end of verse 14? of Ezekiel 37. I will. That would be great. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of, full of bones. He caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones. Say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the words of the Lord of Yahweh. Thus saith, the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, me and the breath came into them, and they lived. They up on their feet, and an exceedingly great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our part. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, and I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Amen. Okay, so that's Ezekiel 37, and we're going to do a quick kind of, uh, we're going to break that up and review that to really understand so we can actually get a picture in our minds of what actually happened there, just so we all have it very clear in our minds. Okay, so what we have here in Ezekiel 37, just to give a summary, and so, you know, it's important to be able to see, to actually have a picture of what is happening in order for us to really understand it. So. In verses 1 to 3, we kind of have an introduction to the vision, and it shows what the problem is. And, of course, the problem is that you have this valley, and it's full of these dead, dry bones. And, obviously, that's not really a good thing. And so, when you get to verse 4, verses 4 to 6, is Ezekiel told to prophesy to the bones, and he's told what to say, right? So yeah, first he's there, and he set him. You know, he was set in the midst of a, in the 
yeah, in the midst of the valley of dry bones. And so he sees all this stuff all around him. And in verse 4, he's told to prophesy to the bones. Then in verse 7 is when he actually starts prophesying. And they, as he prophesies, they are being reformed. That's verses 7 and 8. And then in verse 9, Ezekiel is again told to prophesy, but this time he's not told to prophesy to the bones. He's told to prophesy to the spirit. And the following verse, verse 10, is when Ezekiel actually does prophesy to the spirit, and the bones receive life. And verse 11 is an explanation of the chapter. It's explaining it and summarizing it, and it tells you the stated end. So basically in verse 11, it's kind of, you know, briefly explaining verses 1 to 3. It's telling you who these dry bones are and so on. So it tells you that the dry bones represent the whole house of Israel. And then in verse 12, it's giving an explanation kind of of verses 4 to 8. And... Uh, saying that he'll open the graves and so on, pause and come out of the graves. He's saying basically what he's doing here. And at the end of verse 12, it explains kind of verses 9 and 10. Because it says, well, bringing you into the land of your fathers and so on, after pause, you've come out of your graves. And then in verses 13 to 14, it summarizes and gives a another expanded explanation of verses 9 and 10 and the stated end or you know the end result of everything that happens is said to be the dry bones going into the land of Israel right so we have to see kind of the uh, what here is basically you know we're going to see what's what in relation to this so and there's a context, there's a broader context to this too. I mean, we know that it's talking about going to the uh, land of Israel. If you read Ezekiel 37, it talks about going to the land of Israel 30, uh, or sorry, 36. And then the rest of 37 also talks about going to the land of Israel. And 38 and 39 are clearly set in the land of Israel. So that's just kind of a basic summary. So let's just quickly review out of that again and get it in our minds as to what happens. So Ezekiel, he's set in his valley and looks around and there's this, it's full of dry bones. And then he's told to prophesy to these bones. And so he prophesies to them. And as he prophesies, there's all these uh, sinew, well, first bone comes together with bone and then lays upon it the sinews and the flesh and the skin. And when they're there and they, they are these uh, lifeless bodies laying in the valley again, then he's told to prophesy to the spirit to come from the four winds. And so he prophesies to the spirit, and then she comes and breathes life into the bones. So then they stand up as a mighty army and go into the land of Israel. So hopefully that's a, a clear image now that, we all have in our heads as to the actual picture of what happens here. So now the question is, is this something that is literal or something that is symbolic? So here's a few things that should be considered in, in you know, examining this. In verse 1, we're told that there's a valley. So if it's literal, the question is, where is this valley? So there would be a literal valley if, it's, if it is literal. And um, in verse 4, we see that Ezekiel told the prophesy to the bones. So if it's literal, does it make a lot of sense for Ezekiel to talk to literal bones? Or for anyone to talk to literal bones? Verses 5 to 10 uh, we have this whole, we have two stages of prophesying to the bones, and then they were formed, and then prophesying to the spirit, and then the bones are revived. So the question is, 
what is the purpose of the double prophesying? Why isn't it just prophesying to the bones and then there's that they're reformed and revived, right? There's, it's kind of split up into sections. And the question is, why is it like that? Then in verse 11, the bones themselves talk. And they are, they say, you know, our hope is lost and we are cut off. We're utterly cut off, cut off four parts. And so, then of course in verses 12 to 14, uh, there's talking to the bones again. So all those things, you know, all I'll just ask, can literal bones talk? Nope. Yeah, Teresa says no. And I think that's pretty clear. I don't think anyone here has seen literal talking bones. <laughs> and if that's the case, I'll ask who or what is resurrected in this resurrection, according to the chapter? The whole house of Israel. The whole house of Israel. That's right. And the way it describes the whole house of Israel is this, this valley of dead dry bones. So, if it's if the bones are symbolic, then clearly the uh, the resurrection of the bones would be symbolic too, right? In other words, you can't literally resurrect something which in itself is figurative, because there's no literal bones to be literally resurrected. Go ahead, Leroy. Yes, uh, it sounds like the bones are laying on top of the ground, you know, that he walks among them, you know. And then another place is talking about being resurrected from the grave. Right, right. Yeah, it's true because he saw he saw this valley of dry bones, right? So he could see right, these bones right. around him. And then he walks out and bones are coming together, flesh is laid upon him, and all that happened there. It happened as a result of the wind blowing on them. So they weren't really in graves, at least when he first saw them, and then he used the language of them being in graves. So that's a good observation, Leroy. Thank you for mentioning that. So they're just looking at the text itself, you know, especially since it tells you that it's the whole house of Israel, and the whole house of Israel certainly isn't all dead literally speaking, and as for Israel, it, even if they were all dead, <laughs> they're not all in one valley. So with that, we can see that it's using figurative language. So that's just from the Bible. There are some other things that we'll look at here in regards to Victor Hoddock's writings on the subject. And... Um, this is just some stuff that Doug pointed out in the dry bone study. In Shepherd Rod Volume 1, verse 49, it talks about different classes of the redeemed, and particularly, particularly in this place, it speaks of the heavenly processions. And so I'll read this statement. It's again, Shepherd Rob, Volume 1, page 49. It says, a thought of perfection. So first, you have, you have seven, a list of seven things. Number one is the resurrection of Moses. Number two is the resurrection at the time when Jesus arose. Number three is the special resurrection of Daniel 12:2. Number four is the first revelation or first resurrection of Revelation 20, verse 6. That's the resurrection at the beginning of the thousand years. And then you have the uh, translation of Enoch. That's number five. And number six is the translation of Elijah. And number seven is the general translation at the coming of Christ. So, and then Hoddaf comments on that. He says, thus, we again have the number seven, 
the sign of perfection, all or finished. The four resurrections and three translations comprise all the saints resurrected and translated, all of which make up the total, a total of seven or the end. So there you have seven classes or seven, you know, you have four resurrections and three translations. And Hoda said that that shows that it's all the saints to be resurrected and translated. So the question is, if Ezekiel 37 is a literal resurrection, then why isn't, you know, <clears throat> then these, the seven here would not be complete. You know, there has to be, according to Hoda's statements, there are seven, and that signifies the completion. All of the redeemed were to be resurrected and translated. So when you have an eight of something, what does the number eight signify? New beginning. Teresa said a new beginning. It's a new beginning or a new order of things or, you know, another way to look at that. So when you have another resurrection, Ezekiel 37, and that's an eight on this list, then it would be a new order of things, a new type of resurrection, a new order of resurrection. So that's, as we'll see, it's a symbolic resurrection. And we'll look at what is, you know, what that really means and look at other scriptures that use that language. Um, another place is, Behold, I make all things new, page 65 and 66. That's tract 9, Behold, I make all things new. And there's different categories that are given. And it's... <laughs> It's pages uh, 65 to 66. So this is what it says. All who have acknowledged and profited by his might in the past, along with all who will acknowledge and profit by his might in the future, are to be found in five groups in the kingdom. So there's five groups in the kingdom, which composes all who will acknowledge and profit by his might. So these five groups are one, the 140,000 Israelites, the first fruits of the living, whose nobles shall be of themselves, and whose governor shall proceed from the midst of them. That's Jeremiah 30, verse 21. They shall return to Jerusalem and stand on Mount Zion with the land. Two, those whom John saw after the seeding of the 140,000 gathered from all nations and kindreds and tongues and peoples during the great tribulation, the time of trouble such as never was, the great multitude who go to Jerusalem before the resurrection. Then three is those who have, or those who arrive to everlasting life in the resurrection of Daniel 12, 2. Number four is those Israelites who come forth in the resurrection of Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. And number five is all who come in the resurrection of Revelation 20, verse 6. So, again, to point, just put it in point form, the, the five groups in the kingdom. The first is 140,000. The second is the great multitude. The third is those who come up in Daniel 12, the resurrection. The fourth is those who come up in Ezekiel 37. And then the fifth is those who come up in Revelation 20, verse 6. So, to put it without symbolic language, the 140,000, the great multitude, those who died in the faith of the third angel's message, whoever it's talking about in Ezekiel 37, God's dry bones, and then those who are resurrected at the second home of Christ. Those are the five groups. Then there's another statement on page uh, 41 and 42 of Behold, I Make All Things New, that does, uh, where he lists, I believe there are eight. Let's see. Yeah, there's, there's actually eight uh, different categories of people that he places. This is page 41 and 42 
of Tract 9. It says, The mountain, the kingdom of God, clearly then, is begun with the first fruits of the living, 140,000. And so that's one group. And followed by the second fruits of the living, the great multitude. And it's completed with the first and second fruits of the dead. The 120, those who, yeah, those who received the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, plus those who rose with Christ, plus the great multitude who accepted, accepted him after the Pentecost, plus all who awake to everlasting life in the resurrection of Daniel 12, 2, plus the remaining dead of all ages, who, who rise on the great day of the resurrection. Also those of Ezekiel 37, which is 114. So there you have eight categories of people, and I'll read those eight categories again. First is 140,000. Second is the great multitude. The third is the 120. The fourth is those who arose with Christ. The fifth is the great multitude after Pentecost, and that's the great multitude of the dead. And the uh, fifth one is those who come up in the special resurrection of Daniel 12, 2. And then you have the remaining dead of all ages. So that's going back quite a ways. And then the eighth one is Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 14. Now, what Doug pointed out, if you read pages uh, 5 and 6, or if you go from 4 to 6 in the dry bone study, he takes those two lists that Hoda gives and compares them and shows that the uh, when you compare the lists, they all equate to one another, except for you have this... Um, Actually, I'll just read Doug's comment on because he explains it quite nicely. So this is page six of the Dragon study. Group D, which that is in reference to those who arose with Christ. Group D is composed of those who were dead but were resurrected with Christ and are now alive in heaven, but were not mentioned in the first a numerical list. So they weren't mentioned in the first list. There are also Enoch, Elijah, and Moses who are also now in heaven. Groups C, E, F, and G are still dead in the earth. C, E, F, and G, that's the 120 and those who uh, came in after Pentecost. And then the uh, those who were raised in the special resurrection of Daniel 12 and the remaining dead of all ages. He says, Group H, the resurrected ones of Ezekiel 37, is placed after G, which is the remaining dead of all ages. Therefore, if they, Group H, are not part of any of the specific groups of people who had literally died, C to F, and are not part of the remaining dead of all ages, then they cannot be literally dead and must therefore be made up of those who are alive to the world, but dead to Christ. So there, the basic concept is that in the list that Hoddeth gave, he included all who have, you know, already been resurrected, all who are dead in the graves, so everyone, everyone who's died in his regards, and then he says, also those of Ezekiel 37. So obviously the ones of Ezekiel 37 are not part of those who are presently dead in their graves, literally speaking. So anyways, that's kind of what Doug was pointing out in that point, or that part of the study. So basically the, the lesson there is that when we look at the prophecy itself, we can see the symbolic nature of the various aspects of the prophecy. And, uh, you know, a simple way to keep it in mind is that if there are no literal bones, 
if the bones described there are not literal bones, then that would mean that there are no literal bones to be literally resurrected. So if the bones are figurative, then the resurrection is figurative. Now as to what figurative resurrection is, I mean, we have this throughout the Bible where it talks about, you know, a figurative or a symbolic resurrection. And one such place is Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And we won't go through a lot of these, but I just want to have this in mind. So Galatians 2, 20, it says here, this is Paul speaking, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So there he says that he was crucified, but nevertheless he lives. So that's obviously implying a death and resurrection, which is what we see also in Romans chapter 6. But obviously he's speaking of it in a metaphorical sense, not in a literal sense. So that's just um, another example of, you know, a symbolic resurrection. So if the resurrection is not literal in Ezekiel 37, then it's symbolic or figurative. And then it is the type of resurrection that Paul was speaking of, being raised from death in trespasses and sins, into the newness of life. And Ephesians chapter 2 also uh, covers the same type of uh, metaphorical resurrection, or figurative resurrection. So, it's, um, hopefully that kind of uh, clears up that part. Are there any questions on that before we go on to Psalm 23? You can add Ellen White's comments on it, too. Good point. Yeah. She talks about it, and she she makes quite uh, clear statements, and she obviously speaks of it as being symbolic, and the resurrection of it being symbolic. And the reason why that's so important to realize is because each person needs to understand that they are part of the valley of dead, dry bones and that their bones need to be resurrected. And in that, we need to understand what that resurrection is. So, in understanding that it's being raised out of the life of sinning, you know, being dead in trespasses and sins, like it says in Ephesians 2, and into the newness of Christ's life, the sinless life, then, you know, it's, it's just really important to uh, know that that's what it is because it deals with those of us who are alive and shows the need of resurrection. And that resurrection, let me ask, in the chapter, how, you know, yeah, who resurrects the dead dry bones? Spirit, Holy Spirit. The Spirit, that's right. And of course, we're told that wisdom is a tree of life. Proverbs 3.18. So there's a lot uh, showing that same thing. All right, perhaps now uh, let's go to, unless there's any more questions or comments, we can go to Psalm 23 and uh, get a quick look at what's going on there. And Psalm 23 starts off by saying, a psalm of David. And um, something that I just want to point out quickly, just to keep in mind, is when we see in the psalms, it says something like a psalm of David, or it has some type of thing before the first verse. In the Hebrew Bibles, that is actually part of the chapter, and commonly is the first verse. 
And then what we have as the first verse is actually the second verse in the Hebrew scriptures. And so I know some Bibles don't have, you know, that part of the text, but it's actually part of the text. So it's that's important. Right. To, yeah. Yeah, so that's important to keep in mind. So Psalm 23, uh, I'll just read through it and then uh, we'll see what happens. A Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, so here we have a psalm, and it starts off by telling us it's a psalm of David. And what does that imply, that it's a psalm of David? He wrote it. Teresa says he wrote it. That's true. Any other implications that might be drawn from the fact that it is a Davidic psalm? David is a type of Christ. Teresa says prophetic. And did you say that David was a type of Christ? Yes. Well, I'll, let me ask you a couple of questions about that. I'll ask you a question that Christ asked. The Messiah, whose son is he? Do you remember what the people asked? answered? Uh -huh. When Jesus asked them, you know, he said, the Messiah, whose son is he? What was the answer that people gave him? David. Yeah, the son of David. And who was the literal son of David? Solomon. Solomon. Okay. So, if you read Second Samuel chapter 7, it talks about you know, the promises to David and so on being fulfilled through Solomon and how Solomon was the one to build the temple and so on. In Zechariah 6, the one to build the temple is the branch, which is Christ. And so... And Solomon is the type of Christ, not David. Right. And that's, if you read Tract 8, Mount Zion at the 11th hour, Hoddeth shows that quite clearly, which is why, this is one of the things that distinguishes us as Davidians from messianics. You look at the messianic world and they're looking for the messianic kingdom, which is the kingdom which they think that Christ will set up here on earth for a thousand years. Right? But as Davidians, we believe in the Davidic kingdom. Right? So there's quite a distinction between Davidic, Davidic and messianic. And, um, Basically, yeah, David is, as far as antitypically, we know that there's an antitypical David who is other than Jesus Christ. And so we have, that's what David is a symbol of, or that's who David is a symbol of as far as type and antitype go. And if you read Hosea 3 or Ezekiel 34 or Isaiah 55 or a number of other passages, that will be made all the more clear. Now, what that implies, though, is this. In, in Jeremiah, chapter 23, it says, I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And it talks about how the righteous branch shall, you know, build the temple and so on. That's what you see in Zechariah. And so, seeing that the branch of Zechariah is raised unto David that directly connects the branch with uh, Solomon 
and the typology that's there. Now, what that shows is that the reestablishing of the tabernacle of David, which is prophesied in Amos chapter 9, is the same as far as what the symbol is pointing to. That is the same as the anti-typical building of the second temple. As in, I'll, I'll just rephrase that. The time period to which David typified is the same time period to which the you know building of the second temple typified. So Zechariah and Zerubbabel and Haggai and all those guys, they were symbolizing the same time period that David was symbolizing. In other words, those two scenarios are a type of the same thing. <clears throat> and when you read those prophecies in Zechariah, or the Davidic prophecies, it's clearly the pre-millennial kingdom. And in Ezekiel 37, what, you know, what stage of the kingdom is that? Is it pre-millennial, during the millennium, or after the millennium? Ask that again, would you please? Sure. I was just asking, the, uh, in Ezekiel 37, it talks about this whole thing of the kingdom. It talks about going back to the land of their fathers. I was just asking, is that talking about the premillennial kingdom, or is that talking about the millennium during the past years, or is that talking about the millenn the uh, kingdom after the millennium? Premillennial, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's talking about the premillennial kingdom. And I was just referencing that because what that shows us is that that same time period to which the rebuilding of the second temple was pointing forward to, and to which David was pointing forward to, that's the same time period as the resurrection of the law wants. So that's important to keep that in mind when looking at these Davidic Psalms. Also, Psalm 68 has a layer of typology that deals with David, and that's about the establishment of the pre-millennial kingdom. And there are other prophecies that well, as well which deal with the uh, same sort of thing. So that's important to keep in mind when we're considering the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, what we just established is that the time period to which the time period that uh, David was typifying is the same time period as Ezekiel 37 is pointing forward to. So when we read symbolic songs or prophecies, it's going to have a connection because it's talking about the same period of time. So it starts off, and again, we're, let's go through Psalm 22 again in a little bit more detail. So it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Now, during this time, are there any pastures, green pastures? No. Hmm? No. No? I mean, you're talking about right now, during this time? Yeah, I'm talking about right now, if there are any um, symbolic pastures or anything like that that are pointed right. out. By the, branch, the branch is a symbolic green fish. Yeah, we have the, uh, in Micah chapter 7, which is also a, sev uh, a chapter which is dealing with the valley of dry bones. It talks about no one being righteous and, you know, trusting not in a friend. And there's all, you know, this whole context. And it's t clearly talking about the valley of dry bones as far as the spiritually dead condition of people. And it's also talking about the time period of the Exodus. It references back to the Exodus. And we know that the Exodus movement was also typifying the time period of reestablishing the kingdom, pre-millennially. So that's talking about the same thing. So it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And so we have at least three green symbolic pastures, which are Carmel, Bashan, and Gilead. 
and that's from Micah 7:14. And uh, we found out that Carmel, Ben Roden gave the study story, that Carmel represents the Davidian movement, Bashan represents the Seventh-day Adventist movement, and Gilead represents the branch movement. Or at least the, uh, you know, yeah, it's basically the movements and the uh, places of feeding on spiritual food. Then it says, he leadeth me beside still waters. And I should just mention, we will probably, you know, we'll go through this in a lot more detail for some WebEx study, and we'll make a, a whole study out of it. So I guess we won't go through it in all detail now. But um, there's a few few things in Hebrew. It's actually waters of quietness is a, a more literal rendition of the Hebrew there. <clears throat> but and there's a, a few uh, few aspects of what that either means or could mean. We know. This one we want to mention a couple of things that water symbolizes. Water symbolizes people and truth. Okay, that's good. Water symbolizes people and truth. So if there's going to be people who are in quietness, you know, people who are in quietness are usually people who are resting, you know. And people. Hmm? It sounds like they're at peace, peaceful. Sounds like they're at peace. And how does somebody become at peace? Great peace are they that love thy law. True enough. And it talks about uh, in Galatians coming to peace with God, and in Romans it also talks about this. Uh, Romans chapter five, I believe, how we get peace with God through the resurrection of the Spirit. So that's being raised again the whole resurrection that we've been talking about, the experience of justification by faith. So those who are resting, you know, so in other words, whoever's talking here is someone who is going to be walking among those who are justified. Now that's one aspect. The other aspect of it, like you said, is true. And obviously those who are justified, they have trust in God, obviously they are going to as well have the truth, right? So then, Going on to verse 3, it says, He restores my soul, restoration. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That verse is... like righteousness by faith. Amen. There is truly no other way to obtain true righteousness other than by faith. So certainly it's righteousness by faith. And it is... You know, that passage, verse 3, is somewhat self-explanatory and there you could go into it in a lot more detail so you know he restores my soul you know the soul is the whole being and so it you know so is what Ellen might talk about about you know mentally physically and spiritually you know she talks about how restoration deals with the whole being and she talks about how sanctification is dealing with the entire being so he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And uh, if you compare this with other passages that deal, you know, we have these green pastures and you have this whole thing of paths of righteousness. And it reminds me of some of the passages that we read of in um, Isaiah that prophesy the 9T Reformation. But we won't go on to that right now. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So the valley of death there is, since we saw that this talking about the same time period as Ezekiel 37, that is the same, just like you were seeing the lawn. It's the same valley and of course there's a shadow of death over it i mean all the the bones are dead 
And but he says, I will fear no evil. So this is that same kind of concept as we saw in Psalm 139, kind of having experiencing daytime and the nighttime. In other words, he's going through and it's a time where there's so much death around, but he's alive. He's in the light when they're in darkness. So I will fear no evil. And he says, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff be comfort me. So whoever this uh, person we're speaking to is, which, of course, is Yahweh in the passage, says, you are with me, thy rod and thy staff be comfort me. And this person, again, there's a, I'll have to go and look specifically for where it is, but there are passages in the Psalms, and I might go pull it up real quick, where it talks about a certain, certain Yahweh as our shepherd. Let me just see if I can pull it up quick. Sounds like our sister. Amen. Okay, there it is. It's um, Psalm 80, verse 1. It says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. So we see that the one who dwells between the uh, cherubim is referred to as a shepherd. And here, it's the shepherd of David. In Ezekiel 34, we see that David is the shepherd of the flock and guides them to feed in green pastures. That's Ezekiel 34. We see that David himself has a shepherd, and that's the one who dwells between the cherubim, who, as we've seen in other studies, is our sister. So there's, you know, there are other aspects along with that, and that's why it says, For thou art with me, she's not far off. And it says, Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. And a lot of people have wondered over the years what the distinction is between the rod and the staff. And that's something that I don't know yet. Yeah, that's something I don't know yet. We'll have to see. It's something that I could easily see our sister revealing soon. But I don't know what the distinction is at the present time. So we'll just have to leave that as it is for now and wait on her to show us. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much, sister. Amen. So um, the part after that says, Thou uh, preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. So you have there a table prepared that, you know, there's another place that describes our sister preparing a table, and that's in uh, Proverbs chapter 9. It says, Wisdom has built a house, and uh, it goes on to describe the rest of what happens there with her slaying her or killing her beasts and mingling her wine, setting a table before us. She says, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. So that's a supper of the Lord, which our sister is hosting, which is, you know, there's connections with the daily, of course, with that. But then there's also just the piece of truth that she gives to us. So thou hast prepared, prepared a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. So there's enemies around. So this is uh, kind of such a framework for the time. Reminds me of Psalm chapter 2, where there's the enemies of Yahweh and his anointed. And then in verse, or the last part of the verse says, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And so, that's, uh, you know, anointing my head with oil, making my cup run over. Clearly showing David being the anointed one, same type of thing as in Psalm chapter 2. And uh, cup runneth over. That's showing certainly abundance of grace, abundance of food. 
etc., etc. Then in verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Continued success, continued, um, you know, sanctification and so on. And I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. So that's, again, reference to the kingdom. Dwelling in the house of the Lord. So that's basically Psalm 23. And hopefully that connection with uh, Ezekiel 37 is clear enough. The most important aspect there to show what that is, or to show that it is talking about the same thing, is just showing that this is referring to the same time as Ezekiel 37. Amen. So, okay, good. I was just going to ask if that was helpful, uh, Roland. Yes, amen. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, um, I'm thinking here, we probably won't stay on too much longer just because we've been on for an hour, or at least we've been even we've been on longer than that, but we've been studying for an hour. So I'm thinking perhaps we'll just close off. Um, would you mind closing with prayer, uh, maybe Roland? Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Our loving family in heaven, we just thank you so very much for this branch message. We pray that you'll enlighten us even further, help us to be able to share this truth with others, and help us each one to be what you want us to be and to do what you want us to do. We thank you in the precious name of the branch, both he and she. Amen. 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 Amen.